Thank you so much. Uh, I, I just, I really do want to begin with um, just thanking everyone for the incredibly warm welcome I have received um, since coming to the University of Denver and Denver in the Rocky Mountain West. Um, special thanks to Doug, Doug Scrivener, not only the chair of the board, he was the chair of the search, a most persuasive person, <laughs> and also an incredibly thoughtful leader and a fabulous partner. Thank you, Doug. I, I want to thank the, the whole board of trustees and our fabulous faculty, our staff, our students, our friends, our many friends, our alumni, who have really built this university and who are so incredibly eager for it to move forward, upward, and outward. I want to thank chancellors, emeritus, Dan Ritchie, and Robert Coombe. I am so honored that they are here today. They have really laid this foundation. I will do all I can to realize their vision. And I want to thank Governor Hickenlooper and Mayor Hancock and the panelists today. I think we had a fabulous discussion and how generous of them to come and discuss the future of higher education. And most importantly, I want to thank President Bruce Benson and President Jill Tiefenthaler. Thank you for your wonderful remarks. So I do, like Bruce, also want to thank not only my beloved husband, Fred, but my family who is here today, Kathy and Bob, Nate and Lisa, Lisa's parents, Cindy and Paul. They have put up with me for years traveling around this country, and we're all happy to be together in Colorado. Now they have to put up with my incessant desire to climb these wonderful mountains. And I want to thank my... Thank you, family. And, and I want to thank my colleagues from around the country and my colleagues here at DU. Uh, you know, for us, this is not a job education. For us, this is a mission. This is a passion. This is an adventure. And this is really a launching pad for transformation, for individual lives and for society. So today we really have spent the entire day discussing how educational institutions in Colorado can strengthen the state through the creation of knowledge, basic research, humanities, social sciences, applied sciences, um, the professional schools, how we can help build the future. We've also discussed how each of us, in our own ways, very different, joined together in a common mission to provide access, to recruit and educate the leaders of tomorrow for this state. Now these discussions today really demonstrate the essence of the partnership between democracy and education, a unique partnership in the world. Democracy and education since the founding have shared a set of common values, a commitment to equal opportunity, our wariness of the inertia of tradition, a restlessness with the status quo, and our quest to always make society better. We are a people who passionately believe in the rights of the individual and the importance of the common good and an obligation to work toward a better world. This, these set of values and ideas that education and democracy share are really unique in the world. And they make education be the engine for the future of society. When I'm on all those airplane rides that we presidents like to take to go see our alumni, I sometimes get asked, what do you do for a living? I say, I create future makers. That's what education is about. 
but we should also engage in truth-telling. Our nation and our institutions of higher education often fall so short of these grand aspirations. Unfortunately, we share tragic histories of injustice, including the denials and freedoms and the intrinsic and legal rights of the Native American peoples, specifically with respect to the Arapaho and Cheyenne tribes who once lived and thrived on this very land. The events of Sand Creek and the suffering experienced there bear stark witness to injustice, injustice that we now aspire to make things, to make right. Even as the events of the past remind us of our failures, continually remind us of our failures, they also must renew our ideas and aspirations to provoke us to strive for justice, to fuel our impatience to do right by all people. In the nearly 400 years since the founding of Harvard, as Bruce said, American education has changed dramatically time and time again to help our democracy address new needs to propel us in the future. In 1862, when the country wanted to fuel the economic drivers of the day, it was then agriculture and industry, Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrell Act to establish land-grant institutions in each state. And I quote, in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions of life. And when our nation and universities proudly welcomed home our GIs after World War II, Quonset huts were quickly built on our campuses to accommodate the needs for housing and classrooms, and our faculties across the nation adapted their pedagogy and curriculum to educate a student body that by 1948 was 50% veterans. In the 1950s and 60s, when our economy needed new workers, people of color, and increased numbers of women, entered our colleges and universities. The 1960s saw a doubling of our college enrollments. More faculty were added in the 1960s than the universities combined in this country had hired in the previous 325 years. We were expanding our economy. And then, of course, in that same period, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1957. The United States needed to accelerate research immediately, and they turned to the universities. Historians refer to the 1960s and 70s and 80s as the golden age of education in this country. Federal and state governments poured funds for research and student support and enrollments boomed. Our democracy, and increasingly now the world, has sent us more and more students of differing abilities, ages, and cultural backgrounds. In 1900, just under 240,000 students were in college, a mere 3 to 4 percent of the population. Today, we have over 20 million students who study at over 4,700 institutions in this country. Education and work are the levers to lift up a people, said W.E.B. Du Bois, and that is our educational gospel in the past, in the present, and in the future. So to this government of the people, by the people, and for the people, higher education is such a vital public good that our essential activities are exempt from taxation. Subsidies for financial aid, though they are dramatically reduced from 20 years ago, have allowed us 
to open our doors ever more widely. Federal, state, and local investments, not only through the government but through industry, has allowed us to create research and knowledge and services to improve society. And perhaps most importantly of all, our friends, alumni, and parents have invested in us in small ways and large. Without financial aid, I would have never gotten any of my three degrees. On this campus, as I walk this beautiful campus, I am awed by the philanthropic generosity that fuels our excellence. Look around at DU's buildings, and you will see the names of Reed and Ritchie, Sturm and C. Anderson and Newman, Nagel and Burns, Morgridge and Daniels. And each year, tens of thousands of alumni and friends and parents support the university with gifts of all sizes. They support pioneering programs, such as the program now to teach psychologists how best to serve veterans, how to diagnose autism, the study of healthy aging, or to even, and I do like this one as a scholar of religion, to bridge the study of religion and international relations. Thank goodness the people of this country and increasingly of the world believe Ben Franklin when he said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Now, of course, good and productive partners can disagree from time to time. Rigorous debate is and should be a hallmark of education and democracy. With freedom and our collective future on the line, higher ed has been known to criticize our democracy, protesting McCarthyism, defending free speech and intellectual freedom, demanding immigration reform in the 19th, 20th, and yes, 21st centuries, and debating still today the need to expand opportunities for women, people of color, and others in this country. And democracy, our good partner, has often turned the tables of critique on us. Great debates, science and religion, the classical debate about whether liberal arts ought to be classical or utilitarian. But each time of great criticism of education to democracy and democracy to education, each of those times has resulted in a moment of transformation. And we're in such a time, we are at such a juncture right now. We know the critiques. We have to listen. We have to keep listening. Tuition is too high. Student loans are too onerous. And the pricing model has become too complex. Technology is not used enough. Technology is used way too much and is threatening the social fabric. Millennials are too entitled. We're not reaching the underprivileged. Athletics are too professionalized. The needs of employers are not being met. Education is bloated, ineffective, unaccountable, and entirely out of touch with the times. New, nimble, entrepreneurial communities and organizations are leading models of education founded in the 19th century in the dust. The times we live in are unsettled. We live in a vortex of complexity, pressure, and the swirling winds of disruption. Yet this vortex is historically and I think right now, the moment the transformation can occur. Audre Lorde once said, out of chaos, creation is born. And I believe now is the time to create. DU is stepping forward. Over the last year, we've spoken with 2,500 people in the Imagine DU project. We've done our research, we've interviewed numerous experts, 
Most importantly, we've worked with all of our stakeholders to craft a direction forward that allows us, us to seize the moment for our own transformation and to contribute to those models of education, those new models that Jill talked about. And I love that. We in the West will create them. So today I want to share with you, just briefly, some snapshots. We will be releasing the draft planning document that we are calling DU Impact 2025. It's a draft. We're going to send it out, and we want comments. We will still have lots of revisions to make. But after all of our talk, all of our research, all of our deliberations, we do have a vision. And I just want to quickly try to portray that vision. So let's pretend this. Let's pretend it's 10 years from now. Let's pretend it's sem September 18, 2025. And let's look at DU and how far we've come in 10 years. Snapshot number one, students striving for success. It is 2025 now, and the university has pioneered a new conception of education to ensure that students will flourish in the complex, creative, and rapidly changing work and living environments of a globalized 21st century. DU transforms how students learn to think critically and lead intentionally using new pedagogies, hands-on internships, and career development that helps students actively engage with the world while reflecting on themselves. Our classrooms and our laboratories eliminate all barriers and merge the spaces of the campus and the city and the region and the country and the world. In addition, to getting the traditional academic transcript, our students create a portfolio, a, a way to show visually their passions, their skills, their accomplishments in and out of the classroom. And way back in 2016, we got rid of the traditional residential model that just moved kids into dorms, and we used those spaces and built more to create real neighborhoods, diverse, inclusive neighborhoods, and coached our students to lead those neighborhoods intentionally. And thanks to all of you and that 137,000 alumni, plus parents and friends all around the world, our students get 360-degree mentoring. And when they graduate, they go out in their careers and lead lives of perfect purpose with great confidence. Snapshot number two, designing knowledge in an age of collaboration, Bruce. In 2025, our Institute for Innovation, Entribute, Entrepreneurship, and Te Technology serves the Rocky Mountain West as a catalyst for industry education partnerships, something Colorado has become known for along with Stanford on the West Coast and MIT on the East. What is distinct about our institute in the Rocky Mountain West is that artists, psychologists, and lawyers work side by side with engineers, mathematicians, and anthropologists in what we call DU Design Studios to learn from and help improve underprivileged and underrepresented communities. DU's Knowledge Bridges, the many kind of interstate highways that we build on our campus between and among departments and schools and all of our academic units, attract faculty from around the world who want to work with our extremely gifted and very focused students. Over 10 years, we have developed global partnerships from around the world that bring faculty together and students together, but also civic leaders from around the world to address the big problems of the day. Snapshot number three, Impact Denver and the Rocky Mountain West. By 2025, what Union Station is for transportation 
the University of Denver has become for problem solvers and opportunity builders in the Rocky Mountain West. One year, for instance, our Rocky Mountain Challenges, a joint university community partnership, focused 20% of all academic courses at DU on water. And the Institute for Social Policy Research convened national discussions to raise consciousness about water and to develop real world policy recommendations. Working together nationally and working with the other universities and colleges in the state, we now have a plan for water management in the western states for the next 50 years. Our campus, it's kind of our base camp. It's not an ivory tower. It's a base camp from which our faculty and students and staff and alumni and friends go out in SWAT teams, as we heard today at lunch, to solve problems, to realize opportunities, to serve others. And others flock to our campus. Our campus becomes the go-to place for problem solving, for cultural events, for maintaining wellness and fitness in the Ritchie Center and in the Arboretum. The flow is back and forth. Snapshot number four, 1DU. In 2025, the University of Denver is a place of belonging, engagement, and meaning in a world where now there are very few enduring communities. Alumni and friends say that belonging to DU is one of the most important values and best resources in their lives. Back in 2016, DU introduced a new standard for research universities in this country, an intentional community that is anchored in values, flexible in structures, and aspirational in the intertwined goals of excellence, inclusivity, and innovation, all dedicated to improving the world. We created a community commons, a space for people to gather and share, and yes, we did get more national championships in lacrosse, hockey, gymnastics, and other sports, all creating a wonderful spirit of unity. Back today in 2016, we will, reduce, we will release a draft of this strategic plan and vision, as I said, called DU Impact 2025. It's available at the imagine.du.edu website. I'll share a link with the community on Monday, but I need your help. We need your feedback. We need your ideas. This is still very much a draft. We must step forward in this time of change, in this vortex, in this moment of possibility. I'm honored to be your chancellor at this pivotal moment in the university's history and in the history of our city, our state, our region, and our nation. And what a privilege it is for Fred and me to be here in this beautiful, vibrant, throwing, growing, thriving, exciting place. Just as our region and our state is working very hard to transform themselves, do you and all of our sister institutions of higher education must work hard to transform ourselves. We want and will serve our democracy. There is, I think, a thrilling and very fulfilling future ahead of us, but we must create it. I'm all in. I hope you will join me. <laughs>